see some Cub Scouts. Thumbs up. I see some thumbs up. Andrew Check is not a Cub Scout, but he's got his thumbs up. How you doing, Andrew? You doing good today? That's good. Dan, are you doing good? I am doing fantastic. I had a really great Indian lore class this morning. Uh, you know, a lot of great discussion in it. We were, they, they had to make uh, different food items from Native American cultures. So I got to see pictures of that, and it made me a little hungry. Oh, okay. That's great. I, I've been uh, very busy grading my citizenship in the world uh, class, and uh, they're doing a really good job uh, pointing out countries on maps and stuff like that. They're doing a lot of, a lot of good stuff. Uh, so before I turn it over to uh, Dan, I just want to welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. And I just want to remind you that today at 3 o'clock, we have a very special guest. Uh, a scout from Brazil is going to be uh, talking to us. He's a uh, Camp Trimount alumni staff member, uh, and uh, he has been um, – um, uh, you know, with us uh, most weeks to talk about what scouting is like in Brazil. So you can uh, just be prepared to ask some questions about what it's like in his home country uh, and what, is, what, what scouting is like in Brazil. Uh, he is actually in Brazil, so he's joining us from Brazil today. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool. So uh, make sure you do that. But we're so excited to have a guest here, but I'm going to let Dan introduce. So Dan, take it away. Yeah, so our guest today is a uh, creative arts therapist, which – Personally, I've never heard of myself, so I'm very excited for the presentation as well. Sounds like it's a very exciting profession. So I'm going to turn it over to our special guest, Dawn, to tell you a little bit about what she does. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can send them to me in the chat. And at the end, when we do a question and answer, I will relay them to Dawn for uh, answers. So over to you, Dawn. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dan. And good morning, everyone. It's so good to see everyone. Um, as Dan said, I am a creative arts therapist, um, which uh, not too many people have, have heard of. Uh, it is a, a fairly new field, uh, but it is growing. So the way I like to explain it um, is kind of to break it down. So we've all heard of a therapist, right? Which is someone who you talk to um, when you're having difficulties or issues in life that you want uh, someone to help resolve with you. Um, Sometimes you could be having difficulty with relationships. Um, maybe you're having a difficult time with goal setting. Um, but there's something that um, is troubling you physically, emotionally, spiritually, and you kind of need that guidance that that's someone to kind of hear you out and help. Um, so that's a huge chunk of it. Um, but the cool part is, is that we use art um, to help communicate that as well as words. Um, because for anyone who has ever created art, uh, which I, I hope you've all at least created art at least once in your lives, um, that it, it is a form of communication using uh, the symbols. Um, you're communicating um, different thoughts, um, different things going on inside. And one of the cool things uh, is that oftentimes with art therapy is that sometimes uh, our unconscious will come out without us even knowing. Um, which is a really great tool because sometimes that can be used um, to kind of help process maybe what's going on inside of ourselves. So um, there's a lot with art therapy or creative arts therapy. So I'm specifically um, a visual arts therapist. So I use kind of the, um, the traditional um, arts. So that would be like drawing and painting, sculpture, um, things of that nature. But there are also music therapists, there are dance and movement therapists, there are poetry therapists um, that are all under that realm of the creative arts therapist. And the idea is using the creative process to help uh, kind of channel what's going on inside and, and giving it a voice, so to speak. So like I said, I specifically do with the visual arts. Um, and with creative arts therapists, there's a lot of different um, jobs out there. So you could see art therapists in schools. Um, you could see them in nursing homes or assisted livings. There are art therapists that work in the prison system, um, working with inmates to help re rehabilitate them. Um, there are art therapists who have private practices. Uh, where, or where they have their own private practice or they work in conjunction with other therapists, um, whether it be maybe a psychologist or licensed mental health counselors, but they all kind of work in conjunction at a counseling center. Um, there are uh, our therapists who work in hospitals. 
Um, I know Sloan Kettering in the city has, um, for, with their, um, their cancer uh, unit, they have art therapy there. Um, I can tell you that Children's Cohen's has art therapists for their, um, which is that's their medical hospital. Um, and then they also have uh, art therapists in psychiatric hospitals, which is kind of, that's my niche. <laughs> I work um, at a psychiatric hospital or rather a psychiatric unit. Um, which I've been doing for about a little over five years now where I've been working. Um, and I feel like that could be its own um, Zoom meeting in and of itself because psychiatry is, is um, such a, a big uh, topic. And I feel like it's one of those things that, you know, it's, it's getting a little bit more um, unstigmatized. I mean, we still have a lot of work to do with that, but... Um, I feel like it sometimes could be even one of those taboo topics and, you know, where it's like, oh, mental illness and psychiatric and, you know, I feel like a lot of people are unsure what that is. So, but that's where I work. Um, I've been working on a specific, you know, one specific unit um, for about a year and a half. Prior to that, I worked at a psych hospital where it was 10 different psych units. So I'm very happy to just be on one unit. <laughs> it's uh, way less chaotic. Um, but the idea there is that I help patients who are in acute crisis, because that's what an inpatient psychiatric hospital is for, is for those who are in danger of hurting themselves or, or hurting others. Um, and we help them in that moment. Um, they're usually only there about a week or two. You know, it's kind of like getting them on their feet, you know, and then being able to go to outpatient services. So I... Um, I'm one of the two therapists who are there. My co-partner is an occupational therapist, um, which is a whole nother therapy. So, but, you know, we help rehabilitate the patients and, you know, whatever problems that they're dealing with. Um, there could be um, past trauma or abuse that they're dealing with. Um, they could be dealing with thoughts of hurting themselves, wanting to hurt other people. Uh, they could be dealing with... Um, family stressors or social stressors, you know, unfortunately we have a lot of people who come to us who are, who are homeless. Um, and so they have a lot of those issues that they're dealing with. Uh, but we, we help them as best as we can. And the uh, thing I love most is that it's not just me helping them, but we have a whole team um, that helps. We have um, psychiatrists, we have um, our, our nurses, we have our social work, a team, therapy team, which I'm a part of, you know, and we all help these patients together to kind of get through what they're getting through. And so I specifically, like I said, I do art with them, which is, um, I have to say, you know, it's, it's funny. Some people are so into it. Some patients are so into it. And some patients are so resistant sometimes. And that could be where it's a little tricky. But, um, but you know, you, you, you meet them where they are. And oftentimes the types of art that I do with them, they're usually fairly um, directives is what we call them. Uh, and it's usually something, for example, like uh, I think one of the popular assessments they do is HTP, which is house tree person. I don't often use it as an assessment, but I'll use it as a directive sometimes in my groups where I'll say, you know, uh, draw a house, draw a tree, draw a person. And oftentimes that could lead to information uh, about themselves. Like the idea is that drawing a tree um, is kind of almost like, you know, that's representing the self. So if someone is drawing a tree that's, that's maybe broken or fallen down, you know, that can like lead us to some questions like, oh, well, you know, is, is that how you're feeling right now? Um, if someone, um, maybe has a very full tree, you know, that, that shows like a healthy tree and, you know, we can take things from there as well. So there's a lot of clues that can give away certain things that can kind of start that um, therapeutic uh, conversation and processing. Um, sometimes we do uh, group projects where we'll have patients working together on something. And what we can assess with that is, um, how well they socialize, how well they communicate, um, how they're able to interact with one another, how they can problem solve together. Um, so there's a lot of those types of assessments when you have patients working on like a group project, whether it be 
a mural or, or one of my favorites I love to do is um, have them build a bridge with cardboard and tape because that's, uh, that's pretty challenging, to, you know, to just say, here's some cardboard, um, you know, build a bridge out of it. But it really shows some how creative they could be and, and, and like I said, how they work together. Um, I know there's a drawing directive of draw a person in the rain. And the idea behind that is to see how they care for themselves. So if, you know, if you, they draw a person that is just standing in the rain and they don't have an umbrella or rain boots and they're just kind of being just hit with the rain and they look sad, um, you know, that it just, it prompts questioning like, oh, do you, do you feel you're able to care for yourself? Or are there issues with that? So a lot of them are just really clues. Um, we oftentimes have patients who will just, they'll create something outside of the directive. And oftentimes uh, we let, you know, I, I mean, at least with me personally, I love that because I feel like that there's something they had to get out um, and they're able to, to show it and talk about it. And, um, and just the fact that they feel comfortable enough. And, and a lot of times, like I said, with these different um, simple drawing directives, um, it can provide so much insight um, as to what they're going through, what's going on, and to understand it a little bit. And, and like I said, oftentimes it's kind of the start even of a conversation. Uh, oftentimes it could be very difficult to speak of certain things, um, especially trauma related. Um, th there's actually been studies that have proven that uh, those who have suffered with trauma or have had trauma dealt with, or of dealing with trauma, they, um, they uh, respond better with art therapy because oftentimes they find it very difficult to find the words to to explain it there's actually it's something with the uh, the way the memory is um processed in the brain um it's like all neurological and i'm not gonna get into all that but the um but the idea is that um it's sometimes easier to use those visual symbols as the um the vehicle to kind of start a conversation about what's going on. So now, like I said earlier, I, I am um, a visual art therapist. However, I've incorporated um, movement into my groups. I, I've done uh, creative writing in my groups, uh, sometimes as standalone, sometimes in conjunction with art, um, because I do, like I said, I'm a creative art therapist, so I like to use all different types of um, creative modalities. And oftentimes that's really helpful too with um, patients because you may have someone who doesn't feel comfortable drawing, but maybe they're a great writer. Maybe they'd rather use words and they feel more comfortable with it. So, you know, they have that opportunity as well. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, doing movements uh, could be very helpful because it's kind of using like your physical body. So sometimes, um, for example, if we were talking about strength, I could say, you know, what, what's a, a movement that you feel represents strength for you? You know, and then you have the typical, like someone will maybe be like, they'll make a muscle, um, or maybe someone um, for strength could like do like prayer hands because they feel spiritually their strength. So there's a lot of different um, ways of even communicating with movement. Um, and like I said, when you use them all together, it really could paint a whole story. So, so uh, I, like I said, I do want to touch a little bit about um, the different people I work with, because I feel like that's such a huge part of at least what I do as an art therapist. And if someone were to go into art therapy and go into the psychiatric and behavioral services, um, it is important to know. So, like I said before, um, the patients that we have are people who are in danger of hurting themselves or hurting others. Um, we deal with a lot of patients that have a lot of different um, psychiatric and mental illnesses. Um, so we have people who have different mood disorders. So that would include uh, depression or, or bipolar disorder or even anxiety disorder. Um, there, we have patients who are dealing with psychosis uh, maybe they're hearing voices or they have uh, certain delusions um, that aren't real. Um, 
people who have schizophrenia, which that's oftentimes related, um, the symptoms with that are uh, hallucinations. Um, we have people sometimes with uh, different personality disorders. Um, we have, and with all of those comes a whole bunch of different symptoms. And the thing is that when we have these, these patients and I work with these patients, um, it's usually um, a mix of all these people with all different issues and coming to us um, for, with different things. So I could have a group of 15, 17 patients and I may have, there may be someone who is suicidal, there may be someone who is hearing voices, there may be someone who is having a manic episode, which means um, uh, if you're not familiar, that's where they're usually talking very fast. They can't be, um, they're all over the place. It's, it's think of like a, a, a huge ball of energy um, that's difficult to contain. Um, so you can have all these different types of um, symptoms um, with patients uh, in a group. And sometimes it could be very difficult to manage um, depending on what's going on. But also, again, you know, that oftentimes we try to think of general directives um, because, um, like I said, you want to cater to every member of the group. So I often try to keep it um, with general things, um, emotions, um, things that basically everyone has dealt with before. So I know sometimes loss is a very important topic because people feel they've, they've lost a sense of self sometimes um, with their illnesses. They, they may feel um, they have have a sense of loss even with family members maybe um, in their support system. So I try to keep it um, something related, like where everyone can relate to it. So whether it be loss, whether it be feelings of anger, anger management, that's a really big one. Uh, coping skills is probably the biggest one. And uh, coping skills, it's basically just teaching the patients how to deal with their emotions, how to deal with the uncomfortable feelings. You know, we've all felt um, sadness or anger or anxiety. Um, and sometimes we have to learn to sit with those feelings. And you know, sometimes our patients have difficulty with that. So it's just teaching them how to sit with those emotions, um, you know, without hurting themselves, you know, without punching a hole in the wall or something, learning how to, in a safe and healthy way, deal with those emotions. So we'll teach them about healthy coping skills, um, how to um, maintain healthy relationships. You know, oftentimes we have patients who are in toxic relationships, um, and then having them, you know, learn like how to deal with that. What is a toxic relationship and, and what they can do? Um, unfortunately, you know, we do have a lot of people, um, who have been abused, who have dealt with trauma. Um, that's usually something that we don't want to dive into. Again, like I said, our patients are only with us maybe a week or two. Um, so it really would be unethical to dig into like deep problems. Um, that would be better suited for someone who um, is a long-term like outpatient therapist. Um, and you know, we actually also get a lot of substance abuse patients as well, people with addiction issues, um, and whether that be to, to alcohol or, or to drugs um, or whatnot, but we do have a lot of that. And oftentimes there's um, a comorbidity. And what I mean by that is that there's um, someone who, let's say, has um, an alcohol addiction, um, they would maybe would have an underlying uh, diagnosis of depression, you know, and oftentimes that alcohol would be their coping skill um, to deal with that depression. So it's, you know, oftentimes you kind of see there's like that um, uh, meshing, I guess you, or that, that connection between it. So um, so we do deal with a lot of substance abuse as well and, you know, kind of getting to that heart of or the root of the issue and then again, teaching them healthy coping skills, not to, to use a substance, but to do something healthier. So, um, I'm trying to think what I, I feel like there could be so much, but I'm trying to keep it with specifically with what I do because that's what I know best. <laughs> I can tell you, um, being 
on a psych unit, it's, it's a different, every day is a new day, like a completely new day. Um, you never know what you're going to walk into. Um, the dynamic is always changing because again, our patients are only there about a week or two. So patients are constantly discharging and then we're getting new patients. And when we get new patients, I mean, that's when they're, they're, they are their sickest, obviously, because they're coming into us needing help. Um, so that can sometimes be difficult. Um, sometimes we have aggressive patients um, or patients, like I said, who are completely uh, delusional. Um, they're just completely out of touch with reality. And again, we work with all of these patients. So usually when I go in, I, I like to say hi to everyone. Um, I like to check in with the patients, with the staff, just to be like, is there anything I need to know about? Um, you know, usually in terms of aggression, like be like, you know, is there someone who's going to punch me in the face if I go and say good morning to them? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, because safety is always paramount. Um, so I do that. Every morning we have a team meeting, which I love because that's the entire um, psych team that gets together and we discuss every patient about um, their treatment, um, how they're doing and, you know, their treatment going forward. So that's where we have like the nurses talk about the, um, the medical aspect. Like, are they, are they, um, are they taking their medications? Are they eating? Are they sleeping? Are the medications affecting any of that? Um, and talking about behavior and the doctors obviously are prescribing the medications and they're the ones who are lowering or, or um, changing medications or whatnot based on the, um, the patient's reactions. Um, the therapy, which is me and my um, unit partner, where we're talking about the different behaviors that we notice, um, anything that might be coming up in group um, that the team may not know about. Like if, there is, like if they do talk about um, any significant uh, issues or problems and, you know, we could say, oh, this is what they told us in group, you know, like this is maybe a current problem that we can work with them with. Uh, and then we have our social work team, which they work on the discharge planning. So where are the patient's going to go afterward? Uh, and like I said, we all work together um, to create this um, treatment plan uh, for the patients to kind of help them from the day they walk in until getting them stable and out uh, into the world, really. So we do that every day, which is, like I said, fantastic because we're always on top of that. Um, we, I know me and my unit partner run um, about two or three groups a day, depending on the day and how busy it is. Um, and like I said, where it's, um, my unit partner does more discussion based, I do the creative arts groups. Um, so I, like I said, whether it be art therapy or creative writing, I've even done um, like uh, chair yoga groups with them, usually on Sunday mornings and they love it. <laughs> so you know, I like to do a, a wide variety. Um, and then we also meet with patients one-on-one -on -one, uh, when possible. If someone wants to talk um, about something that's going on, you know, we'll meet with them, we'll talk with them, we'll counsel them as, as needed about whatever is going on. And, um, and then the, uh, the other thing, which, cause I mean, we get into it to do the therapy. The therapist gets into it to do the therapy. Um, but unfortunately with the, the good comes the bad, which is probably the documentation, um, which we, we don't, um, I mean, it comes with the territory. It's not terrible, but we do have to do clinical documentation. So that would be um, where there's an admission note. Um, you have to do a weekly progress note. And then when a patient leaves, you have to do a discharge note. Um, depending on where you go, I mean, every place is different. Um, the place I used to work at, it, I felt like I was writing essays because it was like pages and pages of notes. That's just how they did it. Uh, as compared to now, it's, it's um, definitely not as complex. So, but it comes with the territory where you have to write um, notes about your sessions, about what happened, what was said, um, their behaviors. You know, you have to take, you have to observe, um, you know, were they focused? Were they falling asleep? You know, were they disheveled? You know, or did they, did they take a shower? Maybe they didn't. Um, you know, how they're interacting with others. You know, did they look like they were, um, 
you know, responding to any voices they were hearing in their head. There's all these different observations um, that you would have to include in your notes. So you have to really be aware um, of everyone and their behaviors and what they say. Um, you know, even, you know, what they, what they say, because sometimes, like I said, if you have a patient who's um, psychotic or disorganized, um, you're not going to understand what they say. Like what they're going to say is not going to make sense. And again, you would have to put all of this in your notes. So it's very important to have observation skills um, and, and to have a pretty good memory because you do have to remember all this stuff too for each individual patient. So, um, so I feel like I, I did speak a lot about that. I, I'm trying, I'm also keeping an eye on the time. See, I, I love to talk guys. So I'm, I'm almost worried I may go over the hour and I don't want to do that. Um, so I can tell you how I got into this because this is actually my, um, my second career. Um, prior to this, I was an art teacher. Um, and, and I love teaching art. Don't get me wrong. Um, it'll always have uh, a special spot for me, but where I was teaching art, it was actually, um, at an alternative high school, which for those of you who may not be familiar that, um, some school districts have that where it's basically students who fall through the cracks, so to speak. Um, you know, maybe their attendance isn't so good. Maybe they have behavioral issues at school, um, there could even be substance issues possibly, um, but for whatever reason, they're not achieving um, in a mainstream high school. So they would come to um, the alternative high school for their district. Um, and that's usually it's smaller class sizes. Um, you know, there's a little bit more uh, flexibility and understanding. Um, and, it's, and it's funny, because I think in hindsight, I'm like, wow, like I was kind of even dealing with um, behavioral and possible even mental issues back before I was even an art therapist. You know, I guess I was always attracted to that. Um, so what I noticed, um, like I said, in hindsight, is that a lot of those students, there were, there were definitely substance issues. There was a lot of substance use. Um, there was a lot of um, issues with family, um, students coming from broken homes, um, unhealthy living environments, um, even possibly abusive uh, environments. Um, there were, I, I know, patients who were dealing with um, self-injurious behavior. So actually a lot of things that I, I do see now, there, there was a lot of that. And I remember in the classroom, like you could see that there was something wrong with these students. You could see that, that there was something on their mind. You, you could see that something was happening. And I felt so helpless because I, I didn't know what to do. I was a teacher. Like, I'm like, I know how to teach you art. Like, I know how to teach you the skills, but there was something else. And, and that for me, it was so frustrating. And when I was going for my master's in art education, I, in one of my studio art classes, I had spoken, um, there was um, a student there who was going for art therapy. And I remember her mentioning it to me. Um, and it was basically like, art and psychology and kind of combining them. And I was like, oh, that sounds amazing. <laughs> so um, at that point I had um, decided, I don't know when, but I was like, I'm gonna go back to school for this. Um, and I did eventually, I think it was like six years later or something, but I did end up going. And originally I was gonna go, go to school for art therapy and then go back into the classroom um, that was my original goal, which we could see that went out the window, but that's okay. Um, and I, I remember when it came time um, to do practicums, because before you do an internship, you would do a practicum. And I'll get more into like what you have to do to be an art therapist, but basically it's almost like, it's like 50 hours as opposed to like 300 hours in an internship. It's really just to kind of check the site out to just kind of see like, you know, what it's like. You're kind of just observing. And so I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, oh, I was scared to death to go into to psych, like to check out a psych unit. But I was like, Dawn, this is your only opportunity. You have to, you have to do this. Like just, just to get the experience. And I'm telling you, I was terrified because again, I, there's a lot of stigma attached to mental illness as well as even psych hospitals. You know, a lot of times like, there's such a stigma that it's, 
I don't know, people in, in straight jackets and, and, and drooling. Like, I feel like there's such a stigma and it, it couldn't be further from the truth. So needless to say, um, I'm like, let's just do it. I try it out, scared to death. And I absolutely loved it. Fell in love with sight, 100%. And again, I was just so surprised because I, I mean, looking back and I think like, oh, this is such a silly thing to say, but like, I, I remember being like, wow, these people are just like me, my, my family, my friend, like, they're just like any person you would see, you know, like I said, there's no straight jackets, there's no drooling. Now, again, like I said, there are people who are, you know, living with psychosis, suffering with psychosis, and maybe they're not making sense at that time. But again, with the right um, treatment, you know, getting on the right medications, getting the right um, therapy services, um, it, it's, it's maintained. They're able to live and live a normal life. So I think for me, like, I just fell in love with that and I haven't looked back since. So like I said, I've been doing this for about a little over five years, I'd say. I think it's just over five years. And, you know, I might go back to teaching in the future, but I don't know. I don't see that happening anytime soon because I really feel like I found my niche with this. I love it. And I feel like I still get some of those aspects of teaching because they really are very similar. You know, you're, when you're, you know, running a classroom, it's the same thing as running a group. You might be teaching different, well, in my case with art, teaching different art techniques, possibly, um, answering questions. So, but it is very different. And in fact, I do want to get into that too. Oh, there's so many things I feel like I want to get into. <laughs> so, um, before I get into the do two different types of art therapy, um, I just want to give a little bit of info about what you need to do um, education wise. So you do need a master's degree to be an art therapist. Um, in terms of your bachelor's, you know, it doesn't have to be specifically art therapy. In fact, I feel like it's very difficult to find bachelor programs in art therapy. Um, I can tell you my undergrad was graphic design because, <laughs> so I feel like I, which I never even did graphic design, but um, the people I went to school with, um, they have backgrounds uh, in studio art, in psychology, or criminal justice, uh, in education. So it doesn't have, you don't have to specifically have a bachelor's in, in art therapy. Um, but I can tell you when you go for your master's, there are certain prerequisites. So you're going to have to have um, a certain amount of studio art classes. So that would be like a painting class, a drawing class, um, a ceramics class. So just keep that in mind. If you want to do this, like think about when you're in your undergrad, taking some studio art classes. Um, obviously, you'd also have to take certain psychology classes. Um, again, something to just keep in mind um, in your undergrad that if you're not uh, majoring in either of those, that you would want to take some psychology courses. Um, so, you'd, like I said, you do need to go to grad school for this. It's different grad programs have different credits. And I can tell you, like I said, from my own experience, when I um, went for my art education masters, it was about 42 credits. Um, for this master's programs in art therapy, it's a 60 credit program. So it is, it's, it's, it's definitely a little bit more intense and there's a little bit more work. So just keep that in mind. Um, but it is well worth it if you're into it. Um, so once you get your master's, um, and like I said, there's besides the courses, like I said, there's internships involved with that. Um, but it's not done. It's not like, oh, I got my master's, I graduated, I'm an art therapist. Oh, no, no. Uh, you have to be licensed. You have to go for your licensure. And that is where you would have to get postgraduate um, licensure hours. So that means um, getting hours um, at wherever you're employed um, with a supervised art therapist. Um, and you have to get 1,500 of them. And of those 1,500, 1,000 of them have to be direct client contact. So, uh, which basically means you are working directly with the patient or the client, not doing documentation, not going to team meetings. Um, that takes about a little under two years, I'd say a year and a half to two years. 
if you're working full time. Um, that's about how long it would take you to accumulate those hours um, to get your license. So, but besides, so that's for the hours. You also would have to take an exam. So um, I, I don't want to, because there's the New York State exam, there's a national exam. I know with me, I took the boards and that covered my New York State licensure because you, there's a New York State license, which is the LCAT, um, which is licensed creative art therapist um, for the state of New York. And then nationally, the Art Therapy Association, there's like a national license and that is your ETR, which is art therapist registered. And then when you take the board exams, you get the BC added at the end. So it would be ETR BC. Um, and like I said, that board certification would cover the New York State test. So there's, you know, like I said, I don't want to get too much into that because that's a lot of stuff later on, but it is good to know. And like I said, it's important to know that, you know, a lot of times when you graduate, you think like, oh, it's over and, and that's it. I'm, I'm this. And there's sometimes a lot of work that has to be done after the fact. Um, so, and then with that, cause I, cause I have, um, for years now I have my LCAT and my ETRBC. And again, just cause you have it doesn't mean it's all over. Um, I still have to do professional development, um, which is basically getting, um, CEUs, which is, um, basically getting credits. Cause you know, you want to make sure that you're fresh in the, in your, the field and, and any uh information and because you know the field is always growing and there might be new topics there might be new discoveries um and to kind of help keep you fresh we're required to maintain our licensure and my board certification um i have to do x amount of uh, professional development hours every year so for the lcat it is 36 hours every three years and then for my um ATRBC, it's a hundred hours every five years. So, uh, which actually ironically is the same as um, with my teaching because I still hold my teaching certification and that too is a hundred hours every five years. Um, and of course it's two separate. So, <laughs> but again, if you want to stay licensed, you know, you have to uphold your licensure. And so that means doing this and, and going to these comp, which you would do it by going to conferences, um, now there's been a lot of kind of like this, like Zoom conferences, which are great, but I mean, for me personally, there's nothing like being in person. I'm sure all of you feel that too. Like there's just something different when you're in person and you're interacting with everyone. Um, it's just such a different atmosphere. So uh, that's how you would accumulate your CEUs and they do cost money. <laughs> so just something to keep in mind, you know, that that is going to be an expense um, as well as maintaining your licensure, you know, you have to renew it as well. And that's also an expense. So just something to keep in mind with that, you know, it, it could be costly. Um, but at least, I mean, I could be biased, but it's so worth it. I mean, <laughs> cause I love what I do. Um, so I do want to, like I said, I'm trying to keep in my head and I'm also trying to keep in mind with the time. <laughs> um, I do want to explain the two different types of art therapy because there's art therapy and there's art as therapy. All right, so art therapy is really, that's what I do. That's what you would need a licensed art therapist to do. That, that's where you have, um, where you're processing the artwork, um, you're processing the unconscious, um, the symbols, the, you know, the communication and what's going on um, emotionally, spiritually, physically, and whatnot. That's something you do with an art therapist, okay? That's what I was talking about before. Art as therapy, is basically um, when you use art as a coping skill um, to self-soothe and to relax. So I feel like a perfect example is because it's been such a big thing is, is coloring books. They have like the adult coloring books, um, the mandalas that people color in, uh, the paint by numbers, uh, all of that stuff would be a great example of art as therapy because it's something you can do it at, on your own. Um, there's no, um, processing in terms of what you're creating it's really just you're using it to relax so whether it be like i said you're just drawing a picture just for fun um you're coloring uh knitting or crocheting uh like i said paint which i actually have a paint by numbers i've been doing for my own artist therapy 
Um, but anything like that, which is used, like I said, as a tool to relax um, and, and deal with maybe any anxiety you may be feeling, or just even for fun. I mean, art is great for fun. Um, that would be art as therapy. And that's something that anyone could do. Like I said, you don't need an art therapist. Um, anyone can do that. Um, you know, finding different art. And like I said, art, I feel like is such a broad term because there's so many different types of art. Um, like I said, you know, th there could be with drawing and illustration, and that could be with pencils, color pencils, markers, uh, pastels, whether it be oil or chalk pastels, um, or pen and ink. Uh, there could be, you know, painting, which you have acrylics, you have um, watercolor painting, uh, anything of that nature. You know, th uh, three-dimensional works like sculpture, which could be with clay uh, or even wood, woodworking, which um, I was going to say, which is actually like a foreshadowing for tomorrow, but that's a whole other thing. Um, but woodworking or clay uh, or paper mache, which I happen to love paper mache. Um, so there's all different types. Of, you know, I feel like it's, you know, it doesn't always have to be one specific thing, but it's about maybe finding, you know, what, what you enjoy. Um, even with creative writing, some people love keeping journals and whether it be just journaling what's going on or just journaling any thoughts, whatever comes to mind, poetry, music lyrics, anything of that nature. Um, even with dance, you know, I, to, to move your body, you know, there's a lot of things that you can be done on your own um, to relax. So there's, like I said, I li always like to just do that distinction because oftentimes people will say, oh, these coloring books are art therapy. And, and, and I die a little inside <laughs> when someone says that because it's, it's not, if anything, that's kind of um, insulting to the career because it's, it's not art therapy, but it is artist therapy. And, and both can be very therapeutic and both can be used in conjunction, but they are very, very different. So I know I've talked for such a long time already. <laughs> so I'm going to stop there. And it, please, if there's any questions, I'll, I'm here to answer them. <laughs> so we did have uh, quite a few questions come in. I think you're psychic because about 30 <laughs> seconds after each question was asked, you would answer it. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> yes. Uh, I did have one good question here. How has your job changed due to COVID? Oh, gosh. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so I'm currently, this is um, my home. I'm not at work right now because of COVID. Um, so what happened was COVID hit and our unit was still open because again, it's a hospital, you know, we, we need to treat people. Um, and early April, well, actually I'll backtrack a little. So late March, when it really started hitting, um, and our hospital, cause I, let me explain, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> with this. Um, so I, I work, um, at Syosset hospital. Um, it's a medical hospital, but in that medical hospital, there is a psych unit. That's where I am on that psych unit in a medical hospital. So, um, they did start taking, obviously when COVID hit, our ICU was taking COVID patients, our emergency department. Um, and of course, unfortunately, it was only a matter of time before COVID hit our unit. Um, excuse me. And so we had um, some patients who got it, um, some uh, coworkers of my got it. I was fortunate I didn't, um, but that started happening. And so then we had to start now saying, okay, so now what are we going to do? Um, so what we ended up having to do, because between that outbreak that was happening on the unit and the need for, for beds, for hospital beds, um, the decision was made to temporarily shut the unit um, because they needed, you know, we have, it's a 20 bed unit. And at this point, I mean, every bed counts. So they ended up using our beds for COVID patients. Um, and so at the moment, the, the unit is still closed just in case they're, they're waiting to see what happens. Um, the, reason, the reason they can't easily open it up just yet, um, because with COVID, there's a lot of respiratory issues. So they had to add um, the oxygen lines and the electric to all the patient rooms um, because we didn't previously have that. 
And the thing is, if we're going to go back to being a psych unit, they would have to remove all that. And the reason, because you may be wondering, well, why is because it's a psych unit and um, those oxygen um, tubes, um, the electrical sockets, all that can be a potential risk. If someone is not in their right state of mind, they could hurt themselves or hurt others with it. Again, safety is always paramount. So it would have to be removed before we can even open the unit for psych patients. Um, so right now, because there is so much uncertainty with COVID, at the moment, they're still remaining closed. Now, I mean, that's, I mean, unfortunately, there's a lot of um, mental illness. I feel like it's, it's always been an issue, but with COVID, I feel like there's been such an increase um, in substance use um in suicides uh anxiety uh obviously because you know it's a lot of unknowns with this so i feel unfortunately i i feel kind of torn because i understand where we need to keep the unit open in case um there's a resurgence of covid but on the other hand we have patients who need us right now um you know we there's people in the community that that need our help and i feel like we're not able to help them and for me that's very, very frustrating right now. Um, that coupled with I'm at home and I really miss work. Um, and I really wish I, I could be um, back on my unit. So that's how COVID has um, changed our unit. Now, just so you know, um, it, this is just our psych unit. There are psych units open. Um, so I don't want you to think that there's, there's nothing available. There is, but it's tough right now because again um you know with the issues the mental illness issues it getting worse and then now we're cutting down beds it could be tricky but there are like i know there's um zucker hillside and south oaks that are specifically psychiatric hospitals and they are still open um so there is still hospitals open but Right now, we, we were one of the uh, hospitals, I believe, that they want to designate a non-COVID hospital. Um, so they're being very, very careful, even with, um, like, surgery patients they're letting in. I know they're being very, very cautious. So, so anyway, yeah, so that's how COVID has affected me and my unit <laughs> so far. Um, prior to that, though, we did have to wear all our PPE um, because it was a hospital. So it started out with masks, and then it ended up with wearing the, um, like that last week or so before they closed it, um, I had the mask, I had the shower cap, I had the, um, like the overalls, <laughs> like all those things that you would see, like I guess the doctors and nurses use in an emergency room, I, we were all having to wear on the unit too. And I never thought I would have to do that because um, I'm like, I'm a therapist, I'm not a doctor or a nurse, but there you go. So I, that was for at least the last, we, you know, we had to wear all that PP on us. So, so that's how COVID affected me in the unit. <laughs> I've got a question from Paul here. Uh, how many patients do you get in a day? In a day? Well, I can tell you our, our particular unit um, can hold a maximum of 20 patients. So if we were to discharge um, seven patients, which that would be insane and I hope we don't do that. But if we were to discharge, let's say seven patients the day before, um, there is the potential that seven can come in the next day, you know, because we have that those available beds. Um, so it really it depends. Um, sometimes you can let's say you have um a few discharges and you know maybe it'll trickle in like one will come in the next day, then another one will come in the next day. But it really depends on the need. Like I said, it's it, the dynamic is constantly changing. There's, I mean, I feel like one of my favorite sayings I was told at the very beginning of my career um, was that there's consistency um, in, in the inconsistency almost because it's, it constantly changes. Um, there's no, I guess, answer I can give with that. It's that there's 20 beds and if, if it, it could, it could be anything. It really depends on who's in the um, emergency room, basically. Okay, so I've got another question here from Ryan. Have you ever had patients that no matter how hard you worked with them, you just couldn't help them? 
yeah, unfortunately that's true. Um, that does happen. Uh, I can tell you we have a lot of um, repeat patients, um, people who come back sometimes several times. Um, and listen, you know what? Recovery is never a straight and narrow road. There's often a lot of twists and turns. Um, you know, they say often you, you fall off the horse, but you get back on. Um, and listen, and that's okay. Um, however, there are sometimes we've had patients who come in and they will just flat out say, I'm not taking my medication when I leave. I'm not going to therapy when I leave. I'm going back to doing exactly what I'm going to do and you can't stop me. And they're right. There's nothing we can do. And I have to say that was something I feel um, took a little bit to kind of get used to because, you know, as a therapist, you, you want to help people. You want to help everyone. And, you know, you, you can't control that sometimes. And I feel like the best thing I could tell myself was be like, you know what, Dawn, you did what you could. You did, you know, you did everything you could. You offered all your services to this patient you know, when they leave here, you know, that you gave them the tools they needed, you and the rest of your team, um, and it's their choice. You know, you, you can't control what someone is going to do. You can only control what you can do. And, and that's really what I would have to tell myself, and that I did what I had to do, and now it's up to them. But always keeping in mind that, you know what, if they fall off that horse, and I always tell all my patients, I'm like, listen, if something happens, you know, we're here for you. You know, I would always tell them, think of it um, like a circus and you have the high wire act and then you have that safety net at the bottom and you're like, you don't want to, you don't want to fall. You don't want to hit, you know, but if you do fall, at least, you know, you have that safety net. So I always like to tell them, think of us as that, that you don't want to fail, but if you do, we're here for you. So, you know, but it's tough. And that's, like I said, part of the, you know, reality with it. Some people just don't want the help or they may not be ready for it yet. Okay. Uh, like I said, a lot of the other questions we got, you answered almost right after we got them. Well, I did talk for a while, so that would yeah. make sense. <laughs> All right. But thank you so much uh, for joining us. I have one final thing I'd like to ask. Sure. Do you have any advice for any of our scouts that might be considered getting, uh, getting into the therapy profession? Who might be like wanting to be a therapist? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I would suggest, like I said, if you're going into undergrad, um, definitely taking the uh, psychology courses because um, whether you're going to be an art therapist or a mental health counselor or whatever, because there's a lot of different types of therapists, um, you definitely want to take the some of the psychology courses like intro to psych, uh, abnormal psychology would be a good one to take. Um, I think there's even one with um, intro to personality traits. Um, taking that one, but I would say taking definitely psychology courses, um, 100%. And if you're going to go for art therapy, again, like I said, I would take studio art courses, um, drawing, painting, ceramics, just any of those, excuse me, like basic um, studio art courses, for sure. I would do that in your undergrad. Okay, and I know I said that was the last question, but I had a really good one come in on Okay. Uh, how do you recover from a really hard day at work? Uh, that's a really good question. <laughs> yeah, because some days are really tough. In fact, when I come in, my husband usually knows when it's been a bad day. He could just see it on my face. Um, you know, it's, it's so important for a therapist to employ self-care because there is a lot of burnout. Um, and oftentimes, because as a therapist, um, you're kind of like a sponge and you're kind of like soaking up um, everyone else's burdens and problems, you know, like you're so busy giving yourself to, to helping others, it takes a lot out of you. And, and again, like, kind of like you said, there's some days that are worse than others, you know, I mean, I, I've worked with patients who have been horribly abused, um, physically, emotionally, sexually. Um, I've worked with patients who have been uh, victims of domestic abuse, uh, being a part of it or, or, or seeing it. Um, and, and sometimes some of the things that they tell, it can be very intense and graphic and, and it takes a lot out of you. Um, and so oftentimes, like I said, you, you have to find a way to employ self-care. 
Um, so I know with me, oftentimes I, when I come home, I'll, I'll, sh I don't want any sound. Like I can't even hear the TV. I feel like it's like, I've heard so much that I'm like, I just need silence. Um, so oftentimes I'll, I'll make sure the TV is off. Um, I'll try to not to talk to anyone, kind of unplug a little bit um, with technology. Um, again, I know I said before I have my paint by number um, because I naturally, I love art. So that's always my go-to. Um, so I'll relax and I'll do my, my paint by number um, to relax a little bit. Um, you know, just finding whatever it may be, you know. Sometimes it even helps, um, you know, which a lot of therapists do, but a lot of therapists go to therapists um, because th there's so much that they take on that they kind of need to, to let it out to someone. <laughs> so oftentimes a therapist will go to a therapist to just kind of get all of that out um, and whatnot. So, but it's so important to take care of yourself. Um, something I always tell my patients is that you can't pour from an empty cup. Um, and you got to think of it for yourself. If you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to care for anyone else. So, so it is very important that, that myself as a therapist, that I keep my mental well-being. And that's why, like, I know people joke around and say, like, mental health days, but it really is so important. And, and I know for myself, um, I'll purposely, like, every couple months, like, take a few days off, even if I don't have anything planned. Because I know, like, that's usually my limit. After, like, a couple months, I usually need, like, a few days off just to kind of unwind, relax, and decompress a bit, you know. So I already do. So every two months, I'll make sure I take a few days because I know I'll need that time to just step away for a little bit. So, so it's important to know that. That was a really good question. <laughs> all right. So I think that's about all we have time for. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Scouts, can we get a round of applause? Oh, well, thank you so much. I'm so glad to, uh, to be here. Yep. Uh, so, Scouts, we will see you guys uh, later for your Merit Badge classes. Cub Scouts, make sure you guys keep working on your uh, fun crafts that you have. Boy Scouts, work on your Merit Badge homework. And uh, we'll see you guys later. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks, guys.